My name is uh, Patrick de George. Uh, I'm a philosopher, and uh, for 13 years I was I've been a strategic advisor to the Ministry of Environment in France on biodiversity and climate change issues. And for the last two years, been heading an Anthropocene curriculum program in the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon. And the purpose of this program was to integrate uh, anthropocentric understanding uh, into higher education and research. I'm very honored to be here today, and I thank uh, the Academy for inviting me to moderate this session. Uh, I will open the session with an eight-minute talk, and I count the time because my purpose here is to count the time and make sure that we do not go beyond eight or ten minutes uh, for each of our interventions. And then I will introduce the next speakers and we'll go on. We will not take questions in between the presentation. I was told not to do like that. But we will keep the questions for the end. And hopefully we will have like 15 or 20 minutes or 15 minutes at least to, to exchange between us and with you. Thank you very much. I will then begin now. So, um, what I'm going to do uh, is first give you a quick idea of what an anthropocentric approach to education and research reform could look like. So a few words to begin with on the Anthropocene. Anthropocene, you might, some people might not know the word, it came out in 2012, it was proposed by Kutzen for a Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize of Chemistry, specialist of the ozone layer of planetary security issue. And what the Anthropocene means, basically, is that we are in a situation today for the last 40 years in, where human humanity, I mean industrial, industrialized societies, are the major driver of change of this planet. And a major a driver of change at a scale that has no equivalent in our history. Because if you take the concent in concentration, for example, the concentration of green gas, um, greenhouse gases, sorry, in the atmosphere, there's no equivalent for the last four million years, to my knowledge, and, 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 my, and our geological frame. Uh, if, if you take the extension of biodiversity and degradation of a biosphere, no equivalent for 64 million years, or 66 million years, or 254 million years. So we are in a time where human, humanity is driving change at a geological and biological le level with no equivalent before in the history of our species. Species is only 350,000 years around, it has been around only for that period. So we don't have any biological memory and let less any, uh, even less, uh, I would say, uh, cultural memory because it's the Anthropocene means the end of the Holocene. And the Holocene is the 11,000 years through which agriculture has been possible thanks to the, I would say, the stability of the, earth, of the global Earth cli climate and through which our civilization appeared. And these, this is the only period in the history of the Earth that we know for sure that can sustain the kind of civilization that we have. And we're getting out of this period. And this is creating a change of scale uh, that is, uh, I, would I would say, affecting uh, our, our perception and our understanding of reality. Because as uh, time collides, geological, biological, and evolutionary, social, and historical time collide together, phenomena that we are confronted with uh, are now, in fact, getting into a state of saturation. And we do not, we, when we talk about the Anthropocene, we might be thinking that the human is the driver. But in fact, what is happening in the situation where we are in today is that we are, in fact, we don't know what we are doing. And so what is, like in the presentation we had before uh, where by Gary, saying what is possessing us? So we are, in fact, driving changes, the consequence of which are threatening the inhabitability, the inhabitability of the planet. And so this is a paradox of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is not a period which is driven by human consciousness. It's not the time where we are finally rising to a, some kind of dominion of a planet. It is the time where we are triggering loop changes, loop reaction at the global level that totally escape our capacity to master them. So the reality of the Anthropocene looks much more like that than like a happy garden where we would be on a planetary gardened earth and a, and, a, and a controlled earth. It looks much more like that. And if we understand this reality, then we understand that paradoxically, as Martin would say, the Anthropocene is in fact uh, the result of modernization, 
the more we modernize, the more we ecologize. The more we, div we, 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 we are able to use the natural processes into the weaving of our societies and our, techni and our technologies, the more we become vulnerable to changes in these processes and we trigger changes that escape our capacity of control. And this means that it's the end, of course, of the divide between nature and culture, of course. Therefore, it's the end of the epistemic division or separation in the university between the disciplines. We have, in order to understand our technologies, to take into account now the ecological dimensions. We have to take into account the ecological input of, of our political regimes. This is a new dimension for research and understanding and teaching that we have to bring into our education system. And furthermore, what we are faced today is a new great divide. It's not the great divide, as I said, between nature and culture. It's a new generation of cultural wars, that movement like a um, extinction rebellion around the world with, with uh, the, the younger generation clearly shows the erosion of legitimacy of uh, the dominant and government party in all our countries clearly shows also. So we are in fact in a situation where the division goes between ones now between those who want to prever preserve an inhabitable planet and the others. What are the others? I don't really know. And if we take into account the contribution of the humanities, you can see that a natural scientist ha has come up with one name for this time, the Anthropocene. From the humanities, there's more than a hundred names. And so the big question today is how do we interpret what is going on? How do we give sense? How do we give meaning to all that? And this is the role that humanities have. Humanities do not, you see, humanities, their role is to fight this new cultural war, this new change in our relationship with the rest of nature. Humanities create culture. So this is why we are defending now in the Anthropocene curriculum, and at the international level with the Bridges Coalition, which is partly led by the Moss Secretariat of UNESCO, we are leading a new approaches and reclaiming of sustainability around uh, humanities, which would be humanity-led. And I do not have very much more time, but I will say that it is taking us within this quarter, this higher quarter, with a partnership with the Earth, with a symbiotic relationship with the Earth, because then we understand, if we understand that the biosphere is as much the condition as the, well as the product of all the forms of loved life that constitute it, we need to develop symbiotic systems. And symbiotic systems at the economical, circular economy approach at the political level, and we also need to ingrain this symbiotic understanding, which is quite karmic in nature, into our education systems. And this would open possibilities for a new understanding also of, uh, I would say, the way we understand peace. The question is not only now to make peace between us, it's to be able to make peace with the Earth. And in, in order to do that, we propose to work into an integration of these issues into uh, training systems, lifelong uh, training systems, education systems, uh, through, uh, uh, I would say, a paradigm that we call the paradigm of common health rather than common wealth, and, and to reframe the connections between human health, political health, social political health, and, you, and, and, and ecological health. And you, as you can see with this quick uh, diagram as we that has, was hacked from the Resilience Center, we can clearly organize this program within our SDG existing framework and start transformative approaches. And through this, we could also uh, start territorial approaches, building consortiums between universities, uh, training institutes, and territories uh, with elected bodies and administra local administration to develop pact for co viability at that level. And this is what we are trying to do. And clearly, to end, because I do not have very much more time, I think it's finished, uh, you can see that if you use this kind of dramatic approach to try and understand the kind of disciplines that we need to mobilize, the kind of epistemy that we need to mobilize in order to be working to peace with the Earth uh, and to common health, then you'll see that it's more in the side of the humanities and ecopolitics that we have to, have to work. I think we do not have to think so much in terms of global sustainability, but we have to think the in terms of cosmobiophotical design, working to redesign our relationship to the, to the Earth, which is not the globe, which is not the planetary system, and which is not, thank you very much, uh, only the common world that we have to make in between each other and the social level. And this is the purpose of the Anthropocene curriculum. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now... I will now uh, introduce Benoît Velen. So I'm going to try to do it with one hand. Thank you. I will introduce you in a second. I assume that I can open the presentation. Let's see. Uh, it should be. 
a bit more formal. So I'm introducing now um, Benoît Verlen, who is UNESCO Chair on Global Understanding for Sustainability at the Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna, Germany. Thank you, Björn. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I don't want to spend too much time in formalities and go right into the topic. I will try to elaborate the concept of global understanding designed in respect of the futures of uh, education. When the probably most uh, prominent PhD student of my university, Karl Marx, was saying that human beings only set themselves such problems they can resolve, then you have to know that he was saying that in the age of modernity and not at the age of Anthropocene. Because when in the age of Anthropocene, we need first of all to foster a widespread awareness of the need for appropriate action. There is an old joke. There's one man grabbing around under these lanterns and the policeman is coming up and says, what are you doing there? He said, I'm looking for my key. I said, where did you lose it? He said, over there. And they said, but why are you looking here for? Because there is the light here. And I think we are exactly in that situation that we have the spotlights of science on certain issues and we are thinking that we have to find the solution only in there, but maybe we lost control somewhere else. So with globalization, uh, a long established worldviews are challenged on a broad front. I'm saying very often we are experiencing, we had a 300 year, 400 year brainwash of national or nationalistic thinking, and now we are confronted with a totally new situation and we are not uh, uh, prepared for that. A lot of people are disoriented in this new situation and what we are thinking is uh, strategies that are backward uh, oriented. So backward oriented forward strategies that's the channel space situations in policies. We are looking for solutions in the back in the 19th century of nationalism, but the, the problems we are facing are completely different of that structure. I'm just giving a short illustration of that, of the geographical conditions of the age of the Anthropocene for a simple screen we are using here on stage right now. The minerals are coming from all over the world. So if you are not even moving one kilometer over the Earth's uh, uh, surface, we are living globalized conditions wherever we live. Nearly every product has a globalized constellation in itself. The same is the, true, uh, the case for garbage, especially in respect of the pollution of the air. Depending on the way we are moving on the planet, we are polluting differently our atmosphere and it stays there as smoke at least for five to 10 days. So we can say smoke is a regional problem, we can change it. But after that, um, but we can also say that in 2017, still about smoke situation, four, four mil uh, five million people got killed by polluted air. Uh, but it's even more dramatic. After that, the pollution is transforming into carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide goes in the atmosphere mixes in two to four years around the planet and stays there for at least 100 years. So this is a global constellation of local action. So our local garbage becomes global garbage and the problem is that the most important parts of our life are global commons and nobody is feeling responsibilities for it, for air, water and many other things. So, in the face of global, cultural, social, and climate change, we have no other option than to see our life in a global perspective. Human history, for a very long time, has been embedded in global processes in respect of the natural conditions, atmospheric uh, transformations and so on, but in the social, cultural, and economic respect, this is a totally new situation that we are connecting with the world in real time all over the world. So global thinking presupposes global understanding. So we cannot act saying, think globally, act locally, if we don't understand. 
the global constellation. So to clarify the connection between the local and the global is one of the most important duties, in my view, of future educational uh, uh, curricula. The aim for future education, therefore, is to promote a better understanding of how the local impacts the global that, and to pro uh, uh, provoke actions and decisions that get sustainable outcomes all over the world, every day, everywhere. So what is global understanding very briefly? In fact, global understanding means making understandable how much our lives are embedded in global natural processes, but also cultural, social, and economical flows. So we are embedded in global flows and our actions are contributing a tiny little bit in the change or in the production of this kind of flows in a helpful or less helpful, uh, healthy way. So global understanding clarifies connections between the local and the global. That would be the point. So, but the implications of that are quite dramatic. If you wanna really do that, we have to turn away from our way to think the world in container spaces or nations. We have to turn from that kind of reality interpretation towards a practice-centered perspective. That's the proposition. If we do that, looking at what people are doing in local places all over the world in respect of the global constellation, then we have also to change the idea of environment towards a contemporary world. Because we are part of this world, we are not outside of it. Environment is Heckel's idea to put the surroundings for living species more prominent than others. He has also to change from interdisciplinarity to transdisciplinarity and from the nation national to the global perspective. Just a, a tiny little bit idea of how to do that in 120 seconds, if that's possible. No, no, you please, so please you have one minute. Yeah. Keep the going on. everyday practices in the center of the focus. Every practice is part of the biophysical world with the body of the actor. So the intersection, the interface is going through us and not between the environment and us. But we are also part of the social culture. And with the body, we are always localized in a specific place on planet Earth. And what we are doing is binding or bonding raw processes into our practices. And the way that this should or could happen should be more sustainable than we are doing it today. So three interfaces for the curriculum of future um, uh, education or proposition, how the local impacts the global, how the cultural is the decisive starting point for the interpretation of nature, and therefore that every day life should be the core of science and not according to the scientific division, uh, the, uh, division of scientific labor in disciplines to, un to subdivise everyday practices in all fields of scientific uh, specialization, but looking at what people are doing, what the problem is, and then asking what can the different uh, scientific disciplines contribute to the solution of everyday practices. And that's real transdisciplinarity. We can do that in respect of eating and drinking, how we are integrating the world in our activities by moving and staying or belonging, housing, working, urbanizing, and waste and recycling, preserving, communication, networking, interacting, and sports, entertaining, recreating. So these are all forms or corporal activities where the uh, the global, uh, the local impacts the global. The idea is to launch, maybe with the support of this academy, a new decade on science and humanities for global understanding, reorganizing the scientific organization of knowledge and how to implement it into new everyday practices. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
very good. Okay. Okay. So. Hello to everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to express my deepest gratitude for this uh, invitation to such a prestigious event. And I also want to apologize for not being able to be in Belgrade. Uh, my teaching commitments here in Madrid to Spain did not allow me to travel to Belgrade. I would have loved to do so in any case. Uh, I guess that uh, I met many of you in Rome uh, two years ago in 2017 in one of the previous international conferences on the future of education. And I want to send my best regards to all those whom I met in person. Also, I want to congratulate the World Academy of Arts and Science and the World University Consortium for uh, this continuing effort to think about uh, the future of education, to examine the future of education. And this is unique. I'm sure that there are, I don't think that there is actually such an ambitious program of conferences on education as the one undertaken by the World Academy and the World University Consortium. I cannot think of a task as important nowadays as that of thinking about education. Not so much about our educational systems, but about the education of the human mind. And uh, it is always a privilege to take part in this kind of event. So thank you very much. And also a thank you to Gary Jacobs and to all those who are, uh, have uh, worked in the organization of this conference. It is uh, clear that we live in an age of specialization an excess of a specialization, which many times impedes us from contemplating reality from an interdisciplinary and synthetic world. Uh, one of the tasks of the World Academy and of a conference of this nature is how can we develop what Howard Gardner has called the synthesizing mind. Indeed, how can we think critically of complexity, which is always one of the challenges of each uh, time. Are we prepared for a world in which everything is changing so quickly? Are we prepared for a world in which one of whose main ingredients is rapid technological development and the development of new uh, technological tools, even uh, of artificial intelligence? How can we cope with so much information and so much misinformation? Are not we overwhelmed by this quantity, this outstanding quantity of information? Uh, how can we preserve respect, basic respect for truth, rigor, justice, and honesty in a world in which so much misinformation is disseminated through the internet? Furthermore, how can we re reconcile the need for a specialization, for analytic specialization, with the need for synthesis, be for the magnitude of the global challenges, which cannot be analyzed by a single discipline, but demand the convergence of different approaches. I don't want to be uh, pessimistic. If one asks me about the interplay between education and technological development, which is actually the title of this panel, Rapid Evolution of the Educational System, Impact of Science, Technology and Politics, I want to be optimistic. I think that technology is opening new horizons, new opportunities, such that uh, both the student and the teacher can design their own educational agenda uh, beyond the re traditional rigidities of our educational systems. However, I do not want to be naive. Education may be an ambiguous, an ambiguous tool for a, a technology can be uh, also can be ambiguous for education. It may be positive, but it also may be deeply negative for education. The challenge, of course, is in a world of more possibilities, how can we cope with these increasing, these increasing dangers posed by technology? We have a wonderful opportunity for intellectual cooperation between disciplines and between cultural traditions, for mutual enrichment, in order to build bridges, creative bridges, between the humanities, the sciences, and also between theory and action in order to cope with this challenge of making technology help education instead of seeing how many times, how sometimes technology is uh, representing a danger for the education of the human mind in critical thinking and in creative thinking. <coughs> uh, a few years ago, I attended a lecture by an expert from MIT here in Madrid who 
said that the future of education was going to be defined by four capital letters, S, T, E, M, science, technology, education, and mathematics. I thought that his approach was extremely poor and impoverishing for any attempt at seriously thinking about the nature of education. Because what are we going to do with the humanities and the arts? Why should they not fit in that equation? Is only science and technology, are science and technology the only tools we have for educating our minds? Indeed, I think, and I want to elaborate on this topic, that the humanities are equally important in this task of helping us develop a more critical, creative and free mind. Because the humanities teach us about our home common human heritage beyond difference and fragmentation. And what, what we need to see is the sciences and the humanities not in opposition, not as uh, Charles Percy Snow's famous two cultures, but as complementary dimensions of the human intellectual adventure. After all, the goal of education is to teach us to think on our own as free and responsible citizens. And the challenge is how from our individuality, from the critical and creative exercise of our individuality, we can contribute to the improvement of society, to improving the world. The humanities can help us recognize the human beyond the difference between cultures and individuals. Thus, let us not exclude any source of inspiration in this fascinating challenge that we have before us, which is that of helping us cope with the complexities of our world. The sciences, the humanities and the arts can all, they complement each other in this task. The natural sciences help us understand the structure of reality. The scientific method has allowed us to discover the constituent elements of reality, the building blocks of matter, and the fundamental laws of nature. This is perhaps the greatest triumph of the human mind, which is clearly seen in the predictive power of scientific rationality. But from a philosophical perspective, I think that the beauty of scientific rationality resides also in another element, which is the development of a deeper awareness of what knowledge means. A scientific statement needs to be justified and validated. And scientists are well aware of the fallibility and the fragility of many of our statements. The wisdom in ignorance and the possibility of becoming aware not only of what we know but of what we do not know is perhaps also one of the most striking and illuminating features of scientific rationality. The humanities help us discover that which unites us, the human beyond its expressions. We all face the challenge of thinking about what it means to be human. This is a constant challenge in human history, what it means to be human. The natural sciences help us discover the material elements of our humanity. The social sciences help us understand the historical processes and the social forces that have shaped our humanity, the cultural forces that have shaped our humanity. And the humanities, the art, the, the philosophy, philology, many other disciplines, are also crucial in my view for not only helping understand human nature and human history, but helping us reflect on what we may be, on what it may mean to be human. The arts are the quintessence of creativity, and the arts can teach us a taste of beauty and a taste of expressivity. They can help us appreciate beauty and expressivity. If we combine the sciences, the humanities and the arts, we get 
a marvelous scientific discovery would have been made without imagination. If we want to cope with the future, we need to learn to use technology to help us develop a diverse and interdisciplinary approach to reality in which the diversity of faculties of the human mind must not be seen, in my view, in opposition, but in harmony. Reason, imagination, emotions, empathy, creativity are not opposing forces, but complementary forces, forces which help us admire the wonder of the human mind through the sciences, the humanities, and the arts. The education of the human mind can therefore not be can not therefore be reduced to the education in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. This has to be complemented with an education in the humanities, with an education in the social sciences as well, and with an education in the arts, because they all help us understand what it means to be human. And the question about the future of education is closely related with the question about what it means to be human. To educate, in my view, means to develop to understanding, that. comprehension, meta-intelligence, an intelligence of intelligence, an intelligence capable of analyzing what, it, what has been analyzed, a reflective intelligence that is constantly wondering and, is, and does not dare to challenge the Sorry, um, we had to interrupt the video recording because it's not fair for the people who came here <laughs> if they have to listen from someone who's not there and record it for more than 15 minutes and, and they don't have that much time. But I guess we, I did not have time to introduce Carlos Blanco Perez from the Department of Philosophy, Humanities and Communication in the Comillas Pontifical University in Madrid. Uh, and I, I guess that we had underst uh, clearly understood uh, the position that he is taking. So now, we, before taking a question, we have two more presentations. Would you please, um, um, Daniela Kirovsky from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University mm -hmm. of Belgrade, uh, make int your intervention, please. Thank you. Yeah, just... Uh, <coughs> um, can I start? Yeah. So thank you very much. I uh, just like to introduce myself. I'm uh, Daniela Karelski, Vice Dean from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Belgrade. I am president of Faculty Commission uh, for Quality Assurance and Improvement and the member of Quality Committee of University of uh, Belgrade. So my focus is mainly on the quality. So I would like to talk about quality standards in non-formal education as a challenge in a rapid evolution uh, of the educational system. And my emphasis in this uh, short talk will be on our experience, experience from the Serbian public university, due to the fact that I strongly believe that I can mostly contribute to this conference if I share with you what we have done to improve education and what are the main issues we have to focus with. And I hope that I will just open some questions and that you will help us to get some outwards related to that. So just from the beginning for the us, I'm veterinarian, so we have to be as a teachers and the university level aware that um, we, are, uh, we have very strong weapon in our hands and uh, that it can have great impact on the, our society. And uh, just to remind you, which is for, for the veterinary science very important, that uh, uh, meaning of education have changed. In the beginning, it was focused when, uh, mainly on the general education, and now, but with the uh, uh, rapid development of technology and science, we are mainly, when we talk about education, focus on obtaining professional skills, not uh, general education to get a professional who can uh, work our job. And uh, just uh, to remind uh, that there is formal, informal, and non-formal education. And uh, formal education uh, goes through the educational institution, as, and uh, in that uh, aspect it is, we can say, safe. Uh, because I think that the strength of uh, this formal education is that we have very good quality standards that are very clear defined and we have to 
uh, involve it in our educational system. But the weakness of the formal education, as we are aware of, that it is very rigid and it cannot follow uh, those uh, very rapid um, development changes in technology science and that is the main issue that we have uh, to, f uh, to deal with because if we want to implement, especially in our country, some new curricula, some new knowledge, that it ha takes uh, time. And uh, of course weaknesses that is uh, a one-way direction from the teacher to the student. Uh, so, uh, 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 I just uh, want to say that uh, we try to implement all the standards that are recommended in higher education, uh, not only to the management quality, but also to the quality of uh, teaching process. And for veterinary um, uh, profession, which is a, a regulated profession, which means that it is uh, for society a very important profession, we have some additional standards that we have to follow. So we follow that in the formal education, but, uh, and uh, we get title which is recognized all over the Europe. But uh, what is about informal education? Yesterday uh, someone raised that question, what is the impact on informal education? In, uh, in general education because as we know international standard classification of education does not recognize informal education as a type of education. Uh, it is education uh, that uh, students get uh, through the social media, in the society culture, uh, through the internet. Uh, so I think that this kind of education is very important for our students. And this is the question of the global uh, knowledge, which we strongly support. But yesterday it was also raised the question that we have to have re uh, uh, local approach to the education due to culture and some other differences. So the question is also what is informal education because when you talk about non-formal education which means that um, uh, it is uh, knowledge given out of the educational institution you have some uh, presentation on the internet that are very, uh, uh, very um, uh, connected to the profession but can they be treated as informal or non-formal education? So uh, in, uh, for our students, we try uh, to incorporate informal education in uh, assessment of their final education. And then we have a non-formal education, and uh, that is what we uh, use in our profession a lot, uh, because non-formal education is something that can be get out of the educational institution, and the uh, strength, uh, big strength is that it can follow technological and uh, scientific changes, because uh, it can change more rapidly, but the uh, big weakness that we recognize is that there are no uh, quality standards for not formal education as we need for our professionals. Uh, so uh, in a professional way, uh, non-formal education after diploma is uh, usually called lifelong learning and it is very implemented in the medical uh, field. But uh, as I told you, uh, and what I want to share you, with you, is that non-formal education usually do not have so strict standards of education. And that is the question, uh, what we educate our uh, colleagues, who are educators, who are allowed to be educators. Because the, uh, uh, if we uh, share, if we spread, uh, wrong knowledge, faint knowledge that it can make very bad impact on the society at all. So uh, we in our country, in our profession here, are very focused on the, uh, how to implement uh, quality standards in the non-formal education, which is very important because it can change uh, very quickly. Uh, one of the way we believe is to connect uh, lifelong learning with the university, with the faculties, uh, just with the institution that have some uh, educational standards. Because we always think about that, that it is not a big problem for our profession if uh, our 
students or colleagues don't know some things, but much worse if they, if they are learned wrong and then they spread wrong knowledge. So uh, we are trying uh, now uh, to use all the possibilities to implement um, uh, uh, standards in non-formal education. It is not only our issue, it's a global issue. So there are some ISO standards, especially for non-formal education and in veterinary profession, there are also some standards with, uh, uh, related to the lifelong uh, learning. So uh, thank you very much, my idea. Uh, with the respect of this um, conference was uh, just to emphasize, uh, just to repeat again, what is our main problem. It's, it's maybe small for the global aspect, but it is very important for us to deal with. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Daniela, and for keeping the time so perfectly. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, now, we will we'll have Momir Durovic uh, from the Montenegrin Academy of Science and the Arts. And uh, after uh, Momir's presentation, uh, we will be able to have a discussion and to see how we connect the dots between these different presentations. Uh, when I delivered my inauguration lecture in the Royal Academy of Spain, I was asked to read it. They say when you read, then you know what you're talking on. So I'm going to read this. And uh, I will just read on the few issues concerning formal education, since this is unfortunately less important than going uninformal education in the future. So let me just say that in the first two decades of 21st century, the rate of changes in many human systems has accelerated more dramatically than any time, other time in the history. At the same time, the education system has stayed unchanged. The last change was in 18th century, when education was designed to meet needs of the labor in industrial revolution, what meant performing simple and repetitive tasks. But that era is long ago over. The right to education is fundamental, and in most countries, it is a legal obligation for certain age groups. A lot of research has exposed that schools teach a lot of unwanted and unnecessary information. How is it possible to transform education system, which has great history, inertia, and fear of changes, while being aware that in 20th century, education emphasizes compliance and conformity over creativity, two skills that were at that time necessary to hold down a job for decades. In the first two decades of 21st century, the education is aimed to find pragmatic solution to global problems in the world of growing interdisciplinary collaboration and cooperation while sharing information from different fields. Education is becoming reshaped through new innovative teaching methods, advancement in technology, and pragmatic design. I'm deliberately not mentioning artificial intelligence here. In terms of uh, teaching strategies, it is encouraged a multi-dimensional approach to the education process, which tends to regulate multi-convergent and divergent strategies of teaching. The convergent approach is, as you know, highly structured and teacher-centered. In it, the students are passive recipient of knowledge transmitted to them, while learning achievements are measured by standardized tests, what is one of the worst things in contemporary education. The divergent approach is flexible, student-centered again, where the students are active participants in the learning process, and learning achievements are accessed by a variety of evaluation tests. <coughs> Those should be practiced through individualized learning, where all students' needs, learning styles, and interests are created such to end with the personal curriculum. In that sense, the curriculum, which implies 10 to 20 different uh, subjects, what's the case in my country, I think in Serbia too, and in many other countries, has to be forgotten. The 21st year of education should not be too much formalized. It should be enable the students to acquire knowledge from different disciplines through a unified team, while at the same time practicing different and special ways of the objectives of the integrated units. Thus, in particular, education should be focused on individual students adapting testing to different styles for students and integrating the curricula 
by developing interdisciplinary curriculum units. The coalition P21 identified four skills for today, namely creativity, critical thinking, communicating, and collaborating, which should be implemented in education system. <clears throat> Among the most difficult problems faced by the education system are those associated with the teaching effectiveness. The current, the current preparation of teachers for specific age level, specific subject matter, specific academic skills, etc., does not take in account uh, consideration does not take in con consideration sufficiently the complexity of factors such as students variety various characteristics teaching should be transformed to individual informal individual by informal learning while education will be for all ages it is understood that those changes will result in the shift from practice of abstract learning to practical learning even humanity and social sciences being fa focused on practice skills, practical skills needed for real situation. Obviously, in such process, teachers will become only mentors. In view of the cross-disciplinary trends, the curriculum should be integrated around the topic that reflect the patterns, interaction, and interdisciplinary of different fields. Interdisciplinary curriculum education needs to emphasize students' talents and abilities. They should enable students to study, start to comprehend the world around them through concepts and ideas that are less disparate and disconnected, as well as enable them to live and work with equal opportunities anywhere in the world while keeping up with the interest, their interests and abilities. The creativity and innovation thinking will be more valuable than rote learning of any depth. It is certain that all around the world, schools will not be the same, and they will not, will not act the same. In fact, it will happen a dramatic difference of schools and non-traditional learning experience. This brings evaluation process to top priorities. Evaluation, uh, educational evaluation should pay specific attention to aims, needs, per perceptions, values, and resources, and it should result in specific judgment of word, significance, and meaning of phenomena. Educational institutions usually perform evaluation with purpose to de demonstrate effectiveness to stakeholders or founders and for marketing purposes. The education process influenced strongly by the proliferation of technology. Technology is, an, is at an exponential rate being adapted to teaching and le learning. Such textbooks and curriculum have gone digital. Online lessons and classes have become everyday uh, practice. Computers have been present in all aspects of education. Are the new technologies to improve education system such to meet coming ch challenges, or are they just the toys in the hands of the children? The situation in education sphere can be considered quite controversial. Such, many schools are afraid that technology will replace teachers. Others, in contrary, argue that using gadgets, children will, er will learn better. Certainly, each of, each of these parties is right. Modern technologies will benefit education process and can change many traditional teaching aids only if they are adequately applied. No doubt, great, applica uh, great application of technology will help to introduce interdisciplinary curriculum in teaching practices. <coughs> I'm not deliberately talking on artificial intelligence and education, which is a specific topic, and Velko might talk uh, uh, more in detail on that, which is changing completely education and our life, in my view. Education is primarily a state and health respons and local responsibility. There are st uh, states and communities, as well as public and private organization of all kinds that establish schools and colleges, develop curricula, and determine requirements for enrollment and graduation. Academic freedom and responsibility, which involves professors as well as public review of work together, have long been topic for public concern and debate such to foster the education of students. It is an essential precondition to fulfill the mission of education educating students and advancing knowledge. 
In the education process, teachers must be their own professional responsibility by acting not only professional, but believing, uh, behaving appropriately towards students, being observant, creating a safe learning environment and communicating students at the place of learning, what's not the case, uh, at least in my country. Communicating by, uh, consequently, by understanding the students' needs, a variety of different teaching styles should be used to ensure, ensure none of the students is isolated, is not able to fully participate. In this process, the faculty are responsible for establishing goals for student learning, for designing and implementing programs of general education and specialized studies, and for assessing students' achievement. In that process, there is no agreement on what should be the goals, consensus, and responsibility of quality assurance, which is a big problem uh, worldwide when you communicate with different countries and different communities. I'm finishing soon. Uh, the complex changes followed by scientific, technological, and social uh, challenges which we experience generate many new demands if we want to reach significant improvement of, exi of existing education system. Such education systems cannot be any more based on a single uni unique approach. Basically, it will mean forgetting doing learning to learners but, uh, but practicing learning by and with learners, what should introduce in education critical thinking in problem solving while working collaboratively and communicating effectively. The most important and on top of everything what I said is if education is needed for a job, then it is very uncertain what and how to teach, being aware that we are not clear which job will exist and how they will be performed even in the middle of this century. Such our children would possibly practice in their lifetime, 10 to 14, I'm just finishing one sentence, please. Uh, uh, this is very important. Uh, uh, 10 to 14 different jobs, even sh short jobs, even at the same time, even changing their profession. Moreover, 25 years from now, 65% of uh, Contemporary graduates will be going into jobs they don't exist now. To finish the responsibility, let me say that the respons responsibility in the education process is shared by many actors involving state, local community, public sector, professional institution, as well as existing regulation. And just doing that, it might be possible to achieve responsible achievement, what we are looking for. Thank you.